Okay, so here we are, Genesis, foundation book of the Bible. This is going to be lesson, uh, lesson number two. And I want to remind people who are watching this on video that you can get the study notes uh, for this particular uh, lesson on the BibleTalk.tv website and just go to the Genesis uh, lesson group or series and you'll be able to find the, uh, the notes that are there for those who are doing it online. All right, well, in our last lesson, I introduced uh, our study of Genesis and I made two basic points. And uh, you know, let's do a minute of review here just over the, the points that I made. First of all, that Genesis is inspired. It's God's inspired word. And uh, we gave a lot of reasons for that, but the main reason that I gave is that uh, Jesus and all of the writers of the New Testament refer to Genesis. So when Jesus and Peter and the, uh, John and Paul, when they refer to Genesis and they're uh, you know, referring back to Genesis uh, either through a portion of scripture or an idea, well then that's uh, you know, a textual uh, proof that uh, the uh, apostles themselves considered Genesis in, uh, an inspired word of God. And also you know, if Jesus uh, <laughs> referred to it, that's pretty good. Uh, uh, the pretty good confirmation that Genesis is also an inspired book. So we talked about that last week. Also the other idea that Genesis is important because it, it's the book that explains to us the origin of key elements in our lives. In other words, uh, the origin of the universe, the uh, origin of family, the origin of society, the origin of of evil, how did evil come into the world? Uh, the origin of religion, uh, culture, there's so many. I, I don't know how many I mentioned, 15, 18, something like that. So it's the book of origin, that's what Genesis, that's what Genesis means. Uh, anyways, the book of origin. So those were the two main points we talked about last week. Today we're going to look at another manner uh, of writing and the divisions of the uh, book of uh, Genesis. So let's talk about the authorship, first of all, who wrote it. The main problem here, of course, is uh, how do you write an account that describes things that happened before you were born? How do you write an account of things that happened before anybody was born? So that's always the problem of figuring out, you know, well, who's the author of, of Genesis? There are a couple of main explanations as to the author of the book of Genesis. Uh, the first one is that it was a group of writers that wrote it after Moses. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I agree with, the, I'm just saying these are the main theories that are out there. And I'm sorry for the small writing on the slide there, we'll correct that after. Um, uh, this idea that the person or persons who wrote the book of Genesis where a group of writers after Moses is probably one of the most liberal views held by what are called higher critics. Um, the term higher critic is to help individuals differentiate between groups of theologians. All right? uh, you have other types of theologians that are uh, called textual scholars. And textual scholars are the ones that try to find the meaning of the book by looking at the text. Okay? Higher critics get the meaning of the book or who wrote it looking at other type of evidence. And I want to explain the difference here because if you talk about Genesis with someone, you'll see that you know, you, you, you'll understand where they're coming from if you understand who they're reading or what main idea they have picked up their ideas from. So, Higher critics, they create their interpretation of the Bible by studying the meaning of whatever is written in the context of the literature and the religion and the social customs of all the people that existed in that era. In other words, they're not looking to find out what the text means by looking at the text. They're trying to find out what the text means by studying other texts that existed at the time, other cultures, other social norms that took place at the time. And there's a reason for this. Higher critics believe that the Bible is usually a compilation or a reflection of the influences of the society that it was originally 
written in. In other words, anyone who claims to be a higher uh, critic will tell you that the Bible is just literature. That's all it is. It's a type of literature. And if you want to understand it, you have to study the literature and the, and the custom of the times, okay? For example, I'll give you an example. They will say that the flood, you know, the, the great flood, they'll say that the flood was not really the flood, you know, the worldwide. They'll say that, that's not what the flood is in Genesis. They'll say that's the Jewish people's interpretation of a story or a myth that was written about in other cultures as well. Because if you study other religions, you know, comparative religions, you'll find out that other religions also have in their holy books and in their histories a story about a flood. But higher critics interpret this as meaning well, you know, this group of people, they wrote about a flood because maybe they had floods in the springtime. And then these other cultures over here in this country, they also may have a flood story in their religious uh, periodicals because they were writing about maybe a flood that happened in their country at one time. And the flood that's written in, in Genesis, well, that's just a flood that happened during the Jews' time and they're writing about it. That's how they explain it. The thing that they don't except is that maybe the, older, the other cultures were writing about a flood because it really happened to all of them. In other words, the same flood okay, happened to their, to their ancestors. And the, the source material where they got this story is from Genesis itself. Okay? Now I'm not going to spend too much time on debating you know, higher critics and textual critics, but I just want to give you an idea. When people say, oh, that the flood's just a myth and you wonder, where do they get that? Well, this is where they get that. This is how they get this type of information. So the point is that a lot of higher critics say that Genesis is simply a compilation of old legends and stories and traditions that were verbally handed down and compiled by different scribes between the years 700 BC and 400 BC. Now that's significant because Moses is a historical figure. Moses lived 1,500 years before Christ, roughly, 14, 1,500 years before Christ. So higher critics and others like them say that the book of Genesis was written maybe 700 to 400 years before Christ. It has nothing to do with Moses. So then somebody says, well, why is Moses' name attached to it? And their answer is, well, they had to put a name on the book itself, on this compilation, to give it some sort of validity or authority. So the Jews just put the name of Moses on it. And that's how they come to their conclusion. This conclusion, by the way, is called the documentary hypothesis. And it was originally formulated because they were convinced that Genesis could not have been written so early, in other words, 1,500 years before Christ, because at the time they believed that writing was unknown by man at that time. It was too primitive. Remember, you're talking to people who believe in evolution, so on and so forth. So they say, wow, 2,000, you know, 2000 years before Christ, you know, that's way too far back there. Writing could not have existed, so therefore Moses could not have written it, so therefore we have to come up with another theory to explain this, this book. Okay? So they were influenced by the idea of man's development according to the evolutionary timetable. Now, the interesting thing is that this theory has been proven false, not by preachers. It's been proven false by archeologists who demonstrated, first of all, that writing was widely practiced in Moses' time and even before. Uh, just one quote that I picked up from an anthropologist, R. Linton, he says, writing appears five to 6,000 years ago in Egypt, Mesopotamia, and the Indies uh, Valley. These critics also suggested that the idea of monotheism and, and the high culture that was demonstrated by Moses and the Jews was actually created by writers much later on because 
The development of monotheism and this high culture and this high culture, you know, the very uh, high idea of their religion could not have existed that far back. And again, not an archeologist, but excuse me, not an anthropologist, but an archeologist writes, Dr. Gluck, he says, again, archeologists have confirmed every fact and detail that the Bible puts forth, especially for the times that Moses lived and wrote about. So the guy who's writing this, he's not a preacher, he's an archeologist. And so this higher, this idea that the Bible is just a, or especially Genesis, is simply a compilation of old myths and legends, you know, kind of put together some four or five hundred years before Christ and somebody stamped Moses' name on it. That idea has kind of largely been um, discarded in the last uh, several decades. So anyway, so we're asking the question, who wrote the book of Genesis? And I've given you one theory that had been floating around for a long time and that a lot of people still believe today. All right, so let's, is there another theory who wrote the Bible? Well, the other theory is Moses wrote the Bible. Moses is the author. And of course, this is a much more traditional view that Moses wrote Genesis as well as the other books of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is a term that describes the first five books of the Bible. Penta, five, first five books. Of course, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, those four, those are easy to explain because Moses lived during those times. You know, uh, Exodus describes the, you know, the Exodus, the leaving of the people of Israel from, uh, from Egypt. And who led them out? Well, Moses. So Moses writes about his own experience in Exodus and then in Leviticus and then, you know, and so on and so forth, the other books. But how do you explain him writing Genesis? All right, so there are three possibilities now. Let's break those down. The first possibility is that he received uh, the information by direct revelation by God. Not impossible, God reveals things to people. He's inspired the writers. Second Timothy 3.16, every scripture is inspired by God. And so God could have given a direct revelation to Moses to record as the book of Genesis. That's one explanation. Another one is oral tradition plus the Holy Spirit. In other words, Moses received the information from oral tradition, which was the manner that history was carried forward from generation to generation in those days. And then guided by the Holy Spirit, he recorded and organized these, this information, these traditions into one book called the book of Genesis. So that's the second idea of how it was done. And then the third one is uh, he collected written records and assembled them th with the guidance of the Holy, Sp of the Holy Spirit um, and of course uh, put his uh, name to it. Now all of these methods are certainly possible without violating any principles of inspiration found in the Bible. However, I have to take issue with the first one, which is you know, the direct revelation method. You need to question that just a little bit if you look at how God does things. You know, usually God gives visions and direct revelation about information that is going to happen when? In the past or in the future? Usually it's in the future, right? You know, Daniel had his visions, right? What did he see? He saw the future. Jeremiah you know, had a vision or you know, a revelation from God as to what was going to happen to the Jews. They were going to be carried away for 70 years. When? Well, in the future. So the direct revelation method that God uses you know, to reveal things to human beings, usually, and I can't think of, of a time when it isn't, usually is about the future. Whether it's tomorrow or 50 years from now or at the end of the world, it's usually in the future. Another reason why this direct revelation method isn't suited to Genesis is that um, direct revelation is not usually the method 
God uses to give specific laws and instructions and so on and so forth to an individual? Like you don't dream it, all right? You don't dream the laws. I mean, it's possible, but the, the direct revelationary method is not the way that God provided for other authors of the book in the Bible. So I think the, um, you know, the, the fact that uh, Moses, as the compiler and the editor, that's, huge, that's pretty much the, that answers the most questions about who wrote Genesis. Because the evidence suggests that although Moses himself wrote the books of Exodus all the way to uh, Deuteronomy, he compiled and edited earlier written records preserved from who? Well, from the patriarchs. This would mean that Adam and Noah and Shem and Terah, all of these, each a patriarch in his own era, recorded events in his time and handed them down to the next generation to be preserved and added to for historical purposes. Does that sound weird? Isn't that what we do today? I mean, on a larger scale, mind you, but we write you know, contemporary people today, write about history that's taken place today in books and whatever, and then the next generation will look at those books to find out what was taking place in 2014, right? I mean, a lot of us remember you know, the, the big 50, was it 50 years Kennedy was shot? Yeah, 50, you know, 50 years. We still remember, probably many of us actually saw it happen on, on television. You know, we, we were witnesses, quote, to history. But in another 50 years from now, I doubt there'll be anyone left who actually remembers seeing it. Okay, or 100 years from now. So in 100 years from now, people will have to rely on books written by people who saw it. And so this theory says, hey, the patriarchs throughout history kept records in one way or another of their period of time and passed them on. And what Moses did is he collected these through the uh, inspired direction of the Holy Spirit into the book that we call a Genesis. Now, modern scholarship balks at this idea. You want to get people to laugh at you, you just say what I just said to you know, skeptics and non-believers. They balk at this idea because it goes against the evolutionary idea that man developed from lower to higher forms and so did not record early history. In other words, monkeys can't write. They don't write history. But remember, now you're going to wonder what is, this is, uh, you like that diagram? Remember that the Bible puts forth a completely opposite idea of history when it comes to man. The Bible model of man is that he begins intelligent. He begins perfect. He starts that way. But because of sin, he doesn't evolve, he devolves. He, you know, that little spiral, he devolves. Now he doesn't, it isn't a direct you know, devolving down to nothing. It's more like he sins and he begins to lose much of you know, the perfection that he had at the very beginning. And if you study it throughout history, it's really a cycle of up and down. You know, there's a period where he's up and then it's you know, immorality grows greater, more powerful, and so on and so forth, until there's a crisis that happens, the flood. And then God renews everything and man starts over, like a revival. So it's kind of up and down and up and down and up and down, all the way through history. And what the Bible says is this up and down spiral, downward spiral is going to continue until one day Christ will come and that spiral will stop. And then there'll be the new heavens and the new earth and so on and so forth. Okay? That's the biblical uh, model of humanity. The evolutionary model is exactly the opposite. We start in the primordial soup, right? And then we, 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 we go up, we evolve up. What's interesting is, according to that theory, man's going up, right? He's evolving but it's the only thing that's going up. Everything else is going down, right? Everything else is decaying and falling apart, but we're not going to debate evolution in this particular class. 
So in this model of the Bible man, it is perfectly logical for early man to record and preserve his history and pass it on to the future generation. It's easy to understand. We weren't monkeys, we didn't start from the bottom, we started from the top. These patriarchal records were preserved and Moses collected these, edited them under the guidance of the Holy Spirit in order to produce the book of Genesis, which contains the recorded history of early man. Now, you know, we can accept method two or method three and respect the Bible's teaching on inspiration, but I think method three is more in keeping with the way that God has done things and worked things out for how the Bible was produced. Okay, so just a little bit of kind of insight as to you know, where did Genesis come from, who wrote it, how was it written. Let's take a look at the division of Genesis, a couple of ways to chop up this book for study purposes. The book itself is very long, 50 chapters, and it can be divided in a variety of ways. One way is the um, overview division, and the overview division works like this. It has, uh, if you look at the overview division, there's just two parts to Genesis. Part one is God and His creation, chapter one to chapter 11. So that's all about God and the world He made. Part two is God and His chosen people. That's ch chapter 12 to chapter 50. So chapters one to 11, Genesis focuses just on God and the world that he created. And then starting in chapter 12, it's like a, it focuses in on just one family, one person. And chapter 12 to 50 traces the life and the growth of the Jewish, of the Jewish nation, from Abraham all the way to the time when they're into the promised land and, and so on and so forth. It's as if the first 11 chapters are like a wide shot, if it's, if it's a movie, it's like a wide shot taking in a, a panoramic view, chapters one to 11, and then chapters 12 to 50, there's a zoom in on just, lots of other stuff is going on in the world, you know, other nations, other cultures are being developed and so on and so forth, but the Bible kind of puts those out of focus and just zooms in on one single individual, Abraham, and how through Abraham God created a special nation for his uh, for his purposes. All right, now <clears throat> the second type, uh, you know, the second way to divide it is um, the generational division. Now I said before that Moses may have used the records from the patriarchs in order to compile the book. Now there is some evidence of this from the way that Genesis is put together. If you're a textual scholar, you're looking at the text to find out who wrote it, why, how it's divided, okay? So from a textual perspective, Genesis itself has some clues as to how it was originally put together and it's called the generational division. It's possible to recognize the divisions of these original doc documents because each division contains a key phrase and the key phrase is these are the generations of. Now the word generations comes from, in the Hebrew, comes from the same word that can be translated into English, origins, same, same Hebrew word. Some scholars you know, translate it uh, you know, um, uh, origin, uh, others translate it in a uh, uh, generations. So if this is so, then Genesis is naturally divided by 10 generations given by Moses himself in the book. So let's, let's go to this. If you've got your Bibles, you know, it'd be a good time to flip through them so you can read them yourself. I don't have time to do it up front here, but you just take a look yourself. So if we're going to divide the Bible according to generational division, there are 10. The first one is the generation of heaven and earth, chapter one verse one to chapter two, written by Adam or given to Adam by God. The first generation is the generation of heaven and earth. The second generation is the generation of Adam, chapter two, verse four, to chapter five. So if you've got your Bible, look at chapter two, verse four, and you see 
This is a, like a, a new chapter that begins, if you wish. Note the use of the word book, which suggests there are uh, recorded works and not just oral traditions. Again, all of this contained in the text. The third generation would be the generation of Noah. Look at chapter five, verse one. So think now, Noah had known all of the patriarchs except Adam, Seth, and Enoch. So he writes actual history that, that he lived. Fourth generation, the generation of the sons of Noah. Chapter six, verse nine. If you go to chapter six, verse nine, you'll see there's a change there. Another chapter, if you wish. Not chapter six, you know, chapters one to 50, that, that, that's not Moses that put that in there. Those are modern techniques to help the modern reader kind of break up the book of Genesis. These, these, these records, when they were first you know, used by the Jews, there were no chapters, there were no verses, nothing. You know, the, the page was full of writing. So I'm, I'm, what I'm explaining to you now are not the chapters that were put in by Zondervan Press or you know, a couple of hundred years ago to make the reading of the Bible a little easier. I'm talking about the natural division that's naturally in Genesis. So the generations of Noah, or the sons of Noah, that break, if you wish, is in chapter six, verse nine. And what, well, Noah's sons record the flood and its aftermath. They write about the time that they lived. They lived through the flood, they kept records. They pass them on. The next division, natural division, if you want to call it that, is the generations of Shem. That would be in chapter 10. If you wanted to look at that, you would see, oh, there's a natural break there. In other words, somebody else begins to tell the story. I should have said that at the very beginning, it would have been a little clearer. These breaks that you see in Genesis is another voice that begins to tell the story. So generation of Shem, that's Shem telling the story. Now Shem lived 500 years after the flood. And so he continued recording uh, this period of history. Shem, the Shemites, the Semites, the Jews. The next natural break, number six, the generations of Terah. Chapter 11, verse 10, there's another natural break. It is very short, but it's important because it's only from chapter 11, 10, verse 10 rather, to verse 27, just 17 verses, but here's its importance. It's important because it gives the genealogy between Noah and Abraham. So where the, where the history turns from the world to specific Jewish history, right there, <coughs> excuse me, the generations of Terah. It shows you the human bridge, the genealogical bridge between Noah and Abraham. Gets, how do you get from there to there? Well, that right here is where the writer gives you that bridge, that connection. Number seven, the generation of Isaac, chapter 11, verse 27, all the way to chapter 25, a much longer piece there. So what, what, what is in the generations of Isaac? Isaac records the life and the times of his father Abraham. Terah simply gives you the bridge. I, I, uh, Isaac actually describes the life of, of Abraham. The eighth one, the generation of Ishmael the generation of Ishmael. Again, not very long, 25 verse 11 to 25 verse 18. So in this particular one, and scholars believe this is Isaac actually who is writing this break here. Isaac records his half brother's lineage and you get the Arab tribes there. That's where the people say, where do the Arabs come from? Well, they come from Ishmael. Oh really? Well, they had 12 tribes, just like the Jews had 12 tribes, well, the Arabs had 12 tribes too. Next one would be the generation of Jacob, chapter 29, 5, 19, all the way to 37, the next natural break in Genesis. 
Here, Jacob records the life of his father and also his own life. And then finally, number 10, the generation of the sons of Jacob. So these were recorded by unknown authors and compiled by Moses who wove them into a final chapter which smoothly led to the beginning of his own eyewitness record which begins now, uh, his own eyewitness record begins with the words, now these are the records of the children of Israel. Notice now Moses takes over the narrative in Exodus chapter one, verse one. So now he's not talking about the patriarchs, now he's talking about the children of Israel and Moses knows something about the children of Israel because God selected him to be the leader of the children of Israel. All right, so what we're seeing in these 10, this is, this is how Genesis is naturally divided. Not artificially divided like 50 chapters, but it's natural division, okay? With the different voices telling the different story all the way up to Moses, which picks it up and continues it into Exodus. So what confirms um, inspiration for me personally is that Jesus himself refers to Moses as an authority and an inspired writer. In Luke 24, 27 he says, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he, meaning Jesus, explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Jesus specifically refers to Moses and gives Moses' witness uh, inspired authority. So why do I believe Genesis is the word of God? Because Moses is the one who produced it and Jesus himself confirms Moses as an inspired source. I, I don't know, you know, if you're looking for textual proof, that's all I need. Okay, and then there are other writers who use Genesis as an inspired source. It says another place, Luke 24, now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus himself is saying everything that Moses wrote especially the things that were to be fulfilled in the future, I'm fulfilling them. You know, I don't need to look hither and yon for my proof of, because if I don't accept, you know, let's face it, to deny Genesis is to deny Jesus. Is he lying about that? Well, if he's lying about that, then he's lying about everything else and we're wasting our time here. We might as well you know, get season tickets to the Thunder game or something. All right, well good, so that's lesson two. And I know you're thinking, man, are we ever going to get to the actual text? Yes. Next week we get to the text itself, hopefully it'll be some interesting stuff. I'm just trying to pull out ideas you know, to show you where do people get their ideas about Genesis. But next week we hit the text and it gets a lot more interesting when we're actually studying the text. All right, thank you for your attention.